The more we learn about Prigozhin's coup attempt and its bizarre end, the stranger it all seems. Plus, is Ukraine pivoting its counteroffensive? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. <clears throat> it's June 28th, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get right into it. Okay, first, let's take a look at the control map. Biggest changes, uh, well, they're reporting just minor frontline updates. When we look at Bakhmut, this is probably where we're seeing the uh, most progress, right? And it's just a little bit of movement outside of Klitschivka. Again, this looks more like a repositioning of forces, but it is significant in, in so much as tactically, uh, Ukrainian forces control this tree line. And as we know, these, these tree lines, these forested areas, these windbreaks, they're key defensive structures in this conflict. Um, so while we're not seeing necessarily any breakthroughs per se on the front lines, we are seeing some level of progress. But as we've talked about, this sort of incremental progress is really not uh, not significant enough to change uh, the fundamental layouts of the of the the operational or strategic battlefield. Um, you can see, in fact, some of these areas that are being pivoted to green signify that it's been more than two weeks since they have been liberated. And as we see, uh, it's an indicator of just how little progress we've seen from Ukraine in the last two weeks, right? Um, you know, less about a kilometer in Piatatsky, uh, a few kilometers in Robdine, uh, as well as Again, some level, several kilometers uh, in near Divnopol, Marikivka, outside of Staromayorsk. Um, tiny, tiny progress in Avdivka. And again, probably the second most significant amount of progress actually occurring in the south of Bakhmut. So, Again, an indicator to me, at least, that uh, Ukraine needs to be altering its strategies. Russia's defensive tactics are holding up extremely well, uh, even against modern equipment. I think uh, while it, defense is a complicated art, um, I th in my assessment, at least, one of the things that's defined both this war, but also the war in wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, are how effective mines are. Um, if you think about it, an IED, uh, the most effective weapon in the insurgents' arsenal against all manner of U.S. equipment was basically just a mine, an anti-tank or anti-personnel mine. And, and the U.S., despite tremendous amounts of time and effort, never really proved effectively able to uh, counter that threat. There is no technology that could do it at scale. Um, and so the result was that U.S. forces, right, struggled to gain offensive footholds uh, for a variety of reasons against the insurgencies. But you see here that uh, and from leaked videos and from everything we've seen that Russia's use of mines as both weapons themselves, but also area denial, um, the ability to deny Ukrainian forces the uh, ability to operate in a lot, uh, a huge chunks of the battlefield. And the problem with slow progress in these offensives is ultimately that the way you can, you have to be able to bypass minefields. You have to be able to get through them and then operate in areas before the enemy has time to thoroughly mine uh, a place. The issue is when you have this sort of incremental progress, you know that as the Ukrainians are slowly trying to plod through here, the Russians are improving, laying even more mines in their subsequent fortified areas. You can see here they haven't even reached really the main defensive line uh, with considerable fortifications and almost certainly many more minefields uh, that will be proved likely very difficult to break. So again, I think the signature of this conflict has certainly been the mine. When we look over at the combat map, you guys can see that the primary offensive effort has really started to pivot towards Bakhmut and Klitschivka. Uh, again, I think Ukraine coming late to the assessment that I've been talking about for a while, which is that the book answer, everybody knew there was going to be a big offensive push in Zaporizhia, including the Russians. And the place where the Russians may have actually been the most vulnerable uh, is Bakhmut. 
because this is where Russian forces were not on the defensive. They weren't preparing for defensive operations. They were preparing for offensive operations. This is the area where they've had the least amount of time to prepare. Remember 60 days ago, 90 days ago, huge portions of this area were controlled by Ukraine. So there just hasn't been this sort of very deep, extensive, uh, carefully planned defensive effort in Bakhmut. And bear in mind that defensive efforts are omnidirectional. That is to say, if you've prepared for an enemy that is to your north, the enemy arrives from your east or your west, the defensive structures are simply not going to be as effective. Um, you are going to have disrupted supply lines. You're going to have uh, access to intelligence and and even the actual trenches themselves are not designed to withstand attacks from lateral directions. So the ability to break through somewhere can eventually have effects elsewhere. But again, this comes down to Ukraine realizing it has to fight in places where the Russians are not prepared. Now, uh, before I get into the uh, complexities of the Russian coup, I wanted to shout out CombatVetNews.com. You guys probably have noticed that the uh, there's kind of a double standard if you are an independent analyst versus a mainstream media outlet in terms of what you can and cannot show to your audience. And so to sort of work around that, YouTube uh, has demonetized a lot of my videos. Uh, Patreon has booted me off. Uh, I introduced the members only section of combatvetnews.com. This is where I do analysis of the footage on the front lines. Uh, this is the viral combat footage uh, that gives us insight into the realities of the battlefield that no amount of uh, mainstream media uh, filtration and, and massaging is going to um, separate us from. Right. Uh, and so if you want access to these videos, right, and you want to support what I do and keep me independent, uh, you want to become a member. Any one of these tiers is going to get you access to the members only area and an exclusive room on the discord. So if you want to help me out, uh, support, become the one percent of people who support the channel, uh, I'd appreciate it a ton. The link is up in the description over there uh, and uh, or in or in the description or in a pinned comment. OK, let's let's talk about. What on earth has gone on? Now, there's been a ton of stories out here uh, that are very dynamic, right? Russia has dropped its charges against Prigozhin and others who took part in the rebellion. Um, the Kremlin has pledged not to prosecute Prigozhin or his fighters. Um, and we've seen, uh, of course, Prigozhin is on. Currently, his location isn't known. Um, there's also reports that a senior Russian general, uh, uh, Sotovikin, uh, knew about Prigozhin's action, and uh, he remains very popular among the troops and is very popular in the media. But he did come out, as you may recall, early in the coup, uh, telling Wagner to go home, expressing uh, that one of the most pro-Wagner generals uh, appeared to, at least on the surface, be uh, pro Putin, pro Kremlin. Um, and there's even one re leaked report that alleges that, uh, Wagner planned to capture senior Russian military officials like Soigu, Shoigu and Gerasimov, uh, during their visit to the region along the Ukraine border. The plot was foiled by the FSB two days before its execution. And Prigozhin had to change his plans and make his march toward Moscow. Uh, right. The Western officials believed, according to this report, that the original plan had a good chance of success, but was compromised due to leaked and to do a leak, um, and that now U.S. some people some U.S. intelligence reports indicate that Prigozhin is in a windowless Minsk, Minsk hotel, trying his best to not get unalived. So let's take a, let's let's zoom out a little bit. We've also had, of course, some more statements from Putin indicating that the, quote, Concord company, but not naming Prigozhin or Wagner per se, um, have been fully, you know, obviously received their funding primarily from the Kremlin. They said Wagner fully is fully funded and fully supplied by the Russian MOD to the tune of around a one billion USD um, for its catering contracts and other various work. Um, 
Putin also insinuates, without naming Prigozhin directly, the Kremlin's going to investigate the Concorde company uh, for potentially uh, graft and grift on its military food contracts. Um, he, Putin seems to be trying to separate the person, Prigozhin, from the Wagner PMC, um, really trying to, to, the Kremlin's really trying to have this domestic, basically, information operation to badmouth Prigozhin, but to maintain the integrity of the Wagner group. Um, Putin like, seems to have decided he can't directly eliminate Prigozhin without turning him into a martyr. He still retains, uh, ISW says some support, based on what I've seen, probably considerable support within Russian society and within the Russian regular forces. Um, and the Kremlin needs to disillusion them with Prigozhin um, and de cut off his popular support before they engage in any sort of prosecution or um, worse. Um, right. Uh, Prigozhin, of course, uh, though, asked for military command changes by accusing the MOD of mistreating regular Russian military personnel in combat, uh, which really resonated probably with servicemen and their families. Uh, but it's, again, it, the Kremlin and Prigozhin are really going to be trading a lot of propaganda shots in the, in the media. And, uh, in all likelihood, they're going to uh, continue to do damage to the Russian uh, popular opinion of the war. Now, here's what I thought was really interesting. ISW is uh, has analyzed Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko's account of his mediation between Putin and Prigozhin. Um, and that by sort of uh, and analyzing it in the context of Putin's speech two days ago... Um, it seems like Lukashenko really was maybe more instrumental in brokering the the uh, Prigozhin uh, Prigozhin's withdrawal than we realized. Uh, Lukashenko described at length how he inserted himself into the conflict uh, that demonstrates Lukashenko is a lot more politically savvy than we gave him credit for, certainly than I did, and capable of exerting considerable influence on the upper echelons of Russian politics. Lukashenko described how he managed to broker a deal between Putin and a livid Prigozhin who had refused to answer Putin's phone calls. Um, he engaged both parties through the uh, Russian Deputy Minister of Defense and Russian FSB Director. Um, it sounds like Lukashenko uh, elaborate account suggests that he successfully mediated the crisis within Putin's inner circle that Putin himself could not. That itself is not a great look because Lukashenko has also, in his own quiet way, become more and more independent from Putin. Putin would love nothing more than to be able to, to commit the Belarusian military to the fight in Ukraine. And it seems like he has pulled off a lot of, of leverage and coercion to try to get Lukashenko to do that. But Lukashenko seems to have continually been effective at stopping that from happening. And as the Russian military gets attrited by this war and Belarus remains intact and less sanctioned, uh, Lukashenko's relative power position is growing. So maybe Lukashenko is like the sleeper candidate to become a major power broker within the Kremlin's inner circle, because unlike Prigozhin, who, uh, you know, played his hand hard early in the game. Lukashenko has, you know, done a lot of folding, um, but has more and more demonstrated his ability to um, advocate for himself. And in this case, I actually appear to be uh, a respected peer on par with Putin and Prigozhin. Um, now, is it true? It's tough to say. This seems, this... Uh, this sort of analogy, right? If you were going to make it up, you wouldn't add these strange details like that you would engage these two trusted intermediaries uh, to help make these deals happen. But this is also, again, very common in these sort of negotiations where the, inter the trusted intermediaries are able to get access to belligerent parties uh, in a way that regular old just sending them a text message and a funny gif just isn't going to do. Uh, but of course, Lukashenko himself uh, had to put some stuff on the line. He brought the Wagner Group into Belarus, and it's not at all clear um, that Wagner is done yet. Uh, right? 
Lukashenko has said Wagner will not be able to recruit in Belarus, or at least not able to open recruitment centers, but Belarusians and other nationals will be allowed to join Wagner Group in Belarus. Lukashenko's description suggests the group will act as a training and advisory partner for the Belarusian military, and that Wagner forces have more training than the Belarusian military, and the Belarusian military could benefit from Wagner's extensive combat experience. And he denied claims that Belarusian authorities have already begun to construct camps for the fighters. All in all, guys, this is a really strange turn of events. No doubt about it. Um, it's uh, it's it, This sounds like very much Kremlin power brokering. Um, again, there sounds like there, there may be still some sort of deal uh, that was made. Certainly, I don't think Prigozhin is going to end up worse off than when he started. Um, Prigozhin has had no problem uh, engaging in violence and a high level of cruelty. And if he thought that it would gain him something, he would continue to do it. So anyway, guys, that's really all I had. Thank you so much to the Colonel tier members of CombatVetNews.com. And thank you to our Lieutenant tier members. I couldn't do this without you guys. I appreciate all of you so much, and I'll see you all in the next one.